Spoilers for The Avengers Infinity War ahead. Thanos has a vision of himself saving the universe. After living through some kind of lack of food-related apocalypse, which he tried to prevent by trying to convince one half of the population to kill the other half, he took the name he earned, the Mad Titan, to a whole new level by traveling to planets, wiping out half of their population, and calling it mercy. I guess this must have been taking too long, because he decides to assemble a bunch of super powerful magical stones that when all six are unified in some super powerful magical gauntlet, will allow Thanos to wipe out half of all living things in the universe with a snap of his fingers. Literally. For the moment, I'll put aside the plainly obvious fact that genocide is never the correct answer, because moral arguments probably would not penetrate Thanos' conviction to follow his own twisted moral compass. No. The arguments I wish to raise are much more fundamental, such that even his reality stone can't change it. These are mathematical arguments. This is a high school math teacher does a takedown of Thanos. First, let's try to understand Thanos' logic, such as it is. And I quote, The universe is finite, its resource is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. Thanos concludes from this premise that the best course of action is to destroy half of all life. I'm going to attack this in two major ways, the first mathematically and the second logically. To understand the mathematical problems this solution has, we need to first understand in broad strokes the math we use to describe the populations of organisms. Consider a population of rabbits. Some of them will pair off and reproduce, making more rabbits. Aren't they cute? As time moves forward, there are more and more rabbits. Soon, the offspring reach maturity and can make their own offspring. In nature, population growth happens in an organic way. Gestation period, breeding seasons if applicable, number of offspring per birth, time to grow to adulthood, environmental factors, predators, the availability of food, these all influence the rate at which the population changes. The downside is that there are a lot of factors that are difficult to disentangle. The upside is that if all we want to do is to know how the population changes over time, we can lump all that together in an estimation. Let's simplify the situation, learn what we can, and then add back in the details one at a time. To start, let's assume there aren't any diseases, predators, space or food limitations. Essentially, the population can grow uninhibitedly, which is a word. I want to focus on one particular property the situation has. The more organisms there are, the faster it grows. This makes sense. The more reproducing pairs there are, the more young there will be in the next generation. We could measure the population of rabbits in fixed intervals, say two months, which we'll call a cycle. What we're likely to find using this method is that, roughly, the population increases by the same percent each fixed time period. What we're hoping to get from this is a model, a way of expressing mathematically the relationship between things we can put numbers to. And in this case, those are the amount of time that's passed and the current number of rabbits. We use models for many things, but in this case, we want to make predictions about the future population counts of this system. To build one, let's ask a few questions that will guide our exploration. How can we predict how many rabbits we will have after one cycle? Let's remind ourselves of how we can find the percent of a given quantity by making up some numbers for this one situation. We take the quantity in question, say 15 rabbits, and the percent it increases by, say 20%. What's 20% of 15? Well, we know we can represent all of them with 100%. That means that 20% is only out to here three rabbits. We'll need a process to figure out the quantity when the result isn't a nice whole number, so let's make one. This process feels a whole lot like multiplication. Consider what we would do graphically if we wanted to multiply 15 by 3. We'd line them up like this. Three 15s next to each other, and then count. Looks like we did the same thing. So how do we cast this as multiplication? Well, we'd like to just multiply 15 by 20%, but we need a way of rewriting 20% as something we can multiply, namely a decimal. Think about how it's said, 20%, which is 20 per 100, or 20 over 100. Dividing by 100 is the same thing as dividing by 10 twice. Turns out this isn't hard. Think of it this way. Multiplying by 10 adds a zero, shifting the decimal to the right, but dividing by 10, the opposite, removes a zero, shifting the decimal to the left. Doing this here gives us 0.2. Putting all of this together to get 20% of 15, we multiply 15 by 0.2. You can do this by hand or with a calculator. Either way, you'll get what you need, 3. 
This tells us how much the population increased during that one cycle. To find the new population overall, we're going to add this to the population we started with. This isn't too terrible of a process, one multiplication and one addition. But let's see if we can't simplify it down to a single multiplication. What we now have is 120% of 15, the 100% we started with, and the 20% more after the cycle. Can we just turn 120% into a decimal? Sure. Just move the decimal over by 2 again, which, remember, is just dividing by 10 twice, and you get 1.2. Now we multiply, and boom, we get the same number of rabbits, 18. That's the rule for this system. To find out how much the population increased over the course of one cycle, we multiply the number of rabbits we have at the beginning of the cycle by this percent increase, and we get the new population at the end of the cycle. In fact, we could repeat this, taking this new population, multiplying it by the percent increase again, and see what the population is after two cycles, or three, or four, or however many we'd like. This is just repeated multiplication, and we have a way of representing the idea of repeated multiplication, an exponent. Now we can control how many cycles we want to consider by just fiddling with this one number. If we want 10, we can put a 10 here. If we want 30, we can put 30 here. Mathematicians do this so often that we have a name for it, a variable. That is, we'll put a letter here, and its value can vary between all the numbers we'd like. And, because we're going to use this model we're building to make predictions, we want the freedom to let this variable be any positive number. Here's a few. To take the final steps for this example, let's remind ourselves of the goal, to make a model a mathematical way of expressing the relationship between time and population count. To do this, we need one more construction mathematicians have, a function. What a function is, essentially, is a formal way of relating two varying quantities, in this case, time and population. The way it builds this relationship is by taking an input quantity, whatever makes sense, and it'll do some math with that quantity and give a result, an output. In this case, the math we want done comes from the equation we built. We build it by first naming it, p for population. Now we're going to allow something to vary. In this case, it will be time measured in cycles. We put that in parentheses here. It's a bit weird because usually this means multiply, but in the context of a function, all this means is that t is an input for p. In effect, we're just using a notation, and we're all agreeing to use that same notation so that we can make sense of these ideas. Next, we have an expression for the population after some number of cycles. Here it is. We should set these two things equal. When we get done with a calculation here, it should tell us the population after all, and that's what this p represents. And there you have it. With this function, we can start thinking about how the population will be expected to behave in the future. Let's just graph a few cycles and see what we can come up with. To do this, we'll put two axes down, one that lets us represent the population count, and another that lets us represent the number of cycles that have passed. Each point tells us, for a given moment in time, what the population is. Each time we plug in a new time to our model, it tells us the population right then, and we get a new point. And because the flow of time is smooth and continuous, we can interpolate between these points, that is, draw a connecting curve through them all. Well, this looks good. But there's a problem. It looks like the population is just going to increase to infinity. Well, this shouldn't be surprising. All this model is doing is increasing the population every cycle. And in fact, I suspect this is perhaps what Thanos thinks will happen. But here's the problem with his logic. This isn't the whole story. Remember, at the beginning, we assumed that there weren't predators, food, or space limitations, or any other pressure that would inhibit the population. This was just to begin the exploration, and in fact, this illustrates one great way to explore things. That is, simplify your problem with naive assumptions and remove those assumptions one by one. In this case, it's clear that our model won't hold forever. Real organisms live in real environments, and scarcity of food, space, and resources will eventually lead to competition. Predators, disease, and other deadly factors all apply downward pressure on the population count, dampening the growth rate, and collectively serving as a limit. In a single number, an environment has what's called a carrying capacity, the maximum number of organisms it can support for a given population. We can show this on the graph here. It's a horizontal line because this will be true for all times we're considering. A few things can happen when the population gets to this point. One, the population can slowly approach the carrying capacity, but never quite reach it. 
We say that the model approaches this value asymptotically, and that the carrying capacity represents an asymptote, that is, a value that it approaches but never quite reaches. On the other hand, the population count may instead surge past the carrying capacity, meaning that for a time, the environment will have more organisms living there than it can successfully support. This in turn will cause a dying off as starvation and better fed predators start taking a heavier toll on the population. The population may then plunge past the carrying capacity, leading to fewer predators and more abundance of resources for those that remain. This leads to growth again, causing another dying off, causing another growth, and so on. These swings have a name, oscillations, and they are dampening over time, that is, swinging less and less far in either direction. Eventually, the oscillations will settle down on the carrying capacity, roughly. The Titans, his people, went from being past the carrying capacity by some amount, down to just one, Thanos, in some planet-wide calamity. Maybe there are good explanations for this. Certainly, sapient organisms, that is, life in possession of an intelligence equal to or greater than that of humans, have different pressures governing them. Our societies are far more complex than those of rabbits, having competing political ideologies, laws, religions, standards, morals, expectations, and other sociological influences that are either absent or simply not present in the same degree in rabbit societies. The influence of technology also complicates things, as it's almost certain that Titans had weapons of mass destruction, which might have caused the calamity. So Thanos is right then? Should he cut the population in half to avoid this? Is he really avoiding calamities, the likes of which struck his home? No. Oh my no. No. First, there's no guarantee that a society will experience an apocalypse when they start running out of resources. Yes, one can quibble about the chances of an apocalypse happening, and it being more or less likely, but whatever those chances are, they'll be worse after the snap, which is the name of the event Thanos does at the end of the movie that cuts all populations in half. To see why, let's take a look at the human population. When graphed, it looks something like this. This looks like we're some kind of very steep exponential curve, so let's zoom in on the interesting part here. For the sake of argument, let's invent a carrying capacity for Earth and graph it here, like this. To represent Thanos cutting the population in half with a snap, this is what it would look like. And this little jog here comes about when small catastrophes occur, like those shown in the post credit scene of the movie. Helicopters and cars smashing into things. In other words, Thanos is going to kill strictly more than the 50% he intended to. What will happen after this? Well, the population will resume increasing again. In fact, the rate of reproduction might arguably increase. In America, the generation immediately following World War II, the deadliest human conflict in human history, is called the baby boomers for a reason. What this means is that once the population gets back to where it was before, and it will, it's more likely to shoot farther past Earth's carrying capacity than it would have without a snap. In other words, whatever the odds were of a planet-wide cataclysm, they just got worse some short time in the future, however long it takes for humanity to repopulate. So from a pure maths standpoint, he's not only doomed to failure, he's doomed to make the situation worse. But that's not all. Now, let's look at this from a logical standpoint. First, he absolutely didn't kill just half of each species' population. Drax gets dusted, meaning his society was halved with a snap. But his backstory was that Thanos had already halved his people, meaning that they had just been quartered. He killed Peter Quill in the snap, who was the only human with Celestial in him. Quill's father was also a Celestial, and he spent millions of years searching the cosmos for other Celestials, and he didn't find any, meaning it's a really good bet to say that Thanos just killed 100% of the Celestials. Second, let's give Thanos the benefit of a doubt. Let's say he somehow magically knew that cutting the population down by some percent would magically rebalance the pressures on that society so that they would experience population growth given by a logistic curve, smoothly approaching the carrying capacity instead of shooting past it and causing an apocalypse. How does he know that the magic cutting percent is 50%? And even if it did apply to one society, how would it apply to all of them? There's just no way. Third, he clearly didn't pay any attention to whether or not that society was anywhere close to their carrying capacity. Look at the Asgardians, a race of people that got halved after experiencing their own Ragnarok. Did they really need to be halved? 
it seems to me that what they needed was a place to settle. The whole of their society could fit on a single large spaceship. Sure, the spaceship wasn't going to be able to support them indefinitely, but I don't get the sense it was intended on being a permanent solution. What they needed was a place to land. Fourth, I would be surprised if there weren't populations he may have just doomed to extinction by reducing their numbers too far. The descriptions of the problems they would face are pretty grim, so I'll just say this. You don't want your population to drop below a certain number because extinction becomes much more likely. Fifth, why cut any population in the first place? Why not instead double the resources? This might be tricky, but if you can wipe out half of all life in the universe with a snap of your fingers, then you've got the power to solve the problem of doubling resources. Sixth, and most damningly, there is a crippling logical flaw that he has from the outset. Even if every argument I just supplied can somehow be shot down, there is one problem he cannot escape. He claims that the universe is finite, and thus its resources are finite, and that life will consume them all. Thanos' snap didn't change that. If it's true that the resources in a universe are finite, then all that means is that the best case scenario, someday they will all be consumed. This is true as long as there is life to consume it. Nothing Thanos does in the entire movie changes this. Nothing. Unless he's able to expand the universe and increase resources indefinitely, then he's not ultimately saving anyone from anything. Even in the most generous of interpretations of his actions. This is why the Avengers needed a mathematician in their ranks. I'm free on most days. Save the world. They might have saved the universe from the snap. But then again, Thanos was called the Mad Titan, and he might not have been that good at math. I could go into an analysis of what the chances are of Thanos being swayed, or at what point in the movie it would be best to talk to Thanos about it, or how the mechanics of a mathematician might work with superhero-ness. Who knows, maybe Bruce Banner could break out one of his seven PhDs. What is that guy researching anyways? That doesn't make any sense. But that's not really my speed. After all, you didn't think this was a movie theory channel, did you? I don't know what's coming in Avengers Endgame, but I am psyched, and I will be curious to see how they manage to save the universe and the multi-billion dollar movie franchises that would otherwise remain wiped out with the snap. Thanks to Aragami for hosting this, and to my patrons for their support. This wouldn't be possible without you. And congratulations to you on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing. Yeah, maybe Thor can survive in space, fine. But he can't breathe in space. He can't speak in space. He also didn't have the leverage to swing that spaceship around. And even if he did, all that momentum was lost when the cable pulled taut and the ship halted. And how did that work anyways? When Thor raked across the surface of that ring, how did that one spot not give way when all the rest just shattered? Stars don't shoot energy out in lines like that, and certainly not because some distant iris is either open or closed. How did those things even interact? And even if it could, how can he take the force of a sun when his sister's knife took out his eye? And even if he could, how did his clothing survive? None of that makes any sense.